It's 44 days before voters in South Carolina head to the polls to choose a new governor. In this edition of Quentin's Post Ops, I speak exclusively with James Smith's Lieutenant Governor pick, Mandy Powell's Norrell. And be sure to download the free Quentin's Post Ops app in your Apple or Google Play stores. And listen to this interview later on iHeartRadio. Representative Mandy Powell's Norrell. Hey. It's so good to see you again. <laughs> it's so good to see you too, Quentin. Yeah, I appreciate it greatly. As you know, I ran into you on my heart run down on Lord King yesterday. I know, I know. You were running so hard yes. too. Yes, yes ma'am. You, you do a lot of cardio. I do my best. <laughs> awesome. That is awesome. And this heat, I yeah. really admired you. Oh, thank you. Thank you greatly. And I know that you were hosting uh, a friend from New Zealand. Yes, yes. You want me to tell you about that? Please. I am so excited about this. So in, um, in 2016, I'm with this group called ACYPL, which stands for American Council of Young Political Leaders. And they asked me if I would be the escort for three young Republican um, um, government officials and three young Democrat sure. government officials and take them to meet their counterparts in the New Zealand government. Wow. So that was a huge opportunity. Right. And I took these six um, young political leaders to New Zealand and uh, we uh, we met their counterparts in local and state government, and uh, or you know countrywide government actually. And uh, and I met a uh, a dear friend for the you know we just hit it off immediately. She worked for the for the New Zealand Parliament, right. and her name is Anna. And she told me if I ever ran for high office, she would come and help me. And so James and I were actually politicking in McClellanville one day, right. and uh, I got a call from New Zealand, and she said. Darling, you need me, and I'm coming to live with you for the next seven weeks. And so she's been with me ever since, and it's, it's really awesome to have somebody from the opposite side of the world. And it's fascinating to her because their political races are so different mm -hmm. from ours. Wow. And you talk about opportunity. i got to talk to you about the obvious. Yes. And I'm sure this has been confirmed by the campaign. But according to the state newspaper, uh, Joe Biden is heading to South Carolina next week to yeah. campaign for James Smith. Yes. Yes, we're very excited about that, and and we always knew, you know, that he would come at some point. It's a um, it's an odd thing when you're dealing with, you know, what I call political celebrities. They generally will confirm at the last minute. Sure. And so we've got we finally got the okay to tell people. We've known about it for a little while, but because things can fall through, we couldn't tell anybody until it was a lot closer to the date. So he'll be here on Wednesday. Wow. Wow. Joe Biden, yes. James Smith, yes. Joe Riley, Marlon Gimson. Mm -hmm. What can we expect from this fundraiser in your mind? Well, I expect a lot of money from the fundraiser. I'm excited about that because people are just, you know, really getting excited about um, about you know coming to this and helping us raise money for the campaign. And so I'm thrilled about that. I think any time you get somebody who draws a big crowd like Joe Biden does. Then we're um, we're you know it helps us a lot in our fundraising and you know that's just the the name of the game at this point is we have to raise money in order to get our message out and all the polling shows if we get our message out we win so that's the uh, that's the hard scramble right now is to get the funding to get the message out and you talk about fundraising and message apparently mm -hmm. you have 46 days left in the campaign where yes. are you emotionally? Oh my gosh, as of today we have 44. That's right. We, um, on the 46th day we announced another 46 county tour, okay. which we've hit every county in this state at least once, probably twice, but we're going to do it again before mm -hmm. the uh, campaign is over. And, um, and as far as where I am emotionally, I am, some days I get really tired, but it's a, uh, then we, we meet um, a group of supporters and it's as if they lend their energy to us. Mm. You know, we can be, I remember in Georgetown a couple weeks ago, we, we pulled into a, um, a fundraiser that we were okay. having. It was an event with, um, we, we figured we'd have about 30 people okay. there. And we had been just going nonstop all day long. And you get really tired when you travel that much. And so uh, we were eating, I know you could eat coffee beans, but James had gotten some coffee beans somewhere and we were just eating them to try to wake up. Right. And then we saw this crowd and they were backed out the door, down the sidewalk. And we, were, we just suddenly, like we didn't need those coffee beans anymore. It was the energy 
that we got from just seeing people who support the campaign that um, it just fuels everything and then you just get so excited mm -hmm. and, and so energized and thrilled and, I, and I'd liken it to all of these supporters lending us their energy that keep us going because there's so much at stake in this campaign. There's so much at stake in terms of who wins right. this next race. We've got redistricting, we've got health care, we've got public education, and the people who will um, who will benefit from our policies if we um, if we win have a tremendous amount at stake. So I always say we can't we can't sleep. We can sleep after this is over. You know, it ends November six. We can sleep we can sleep on November seventh, okay. but we have to do every single thing we possibly can to win because it's it's really not even overly dramatic to say this is a life or death thing because there are people right now who are losing their battles with their illnesses because we didn't accept the health care funds from the federal government. And um, it, not to mention it would create 40,000 new jobs and inject $2 billion a year into our economy. Our current governor has refused to accept those funds and someone told me the other day that it's estimated that 150 people in South Carolina die every year because we did not accept those funds and cover our citizens with insurance and it would not have cost us a thing to do that. And so on day one, James is going to accept those funds and it's going to make a huge difference in people's lives. So that's what's at stake in this election. So we can't let up and we can't rest and we can't, uh, we can't give in to exhaustion. And thank goodness we're not feeling too much exhaustion because our, um, our friends and supporters along the way are just are giving us that energy and giving us that push and investing their own time right. and energy into the campaign. And you stay in Georgetown, obviously there's a threat about the particular river rivers there being rising, actually rising because of yes. the effects of Florence. Oh my gosh. It's so sad. We um we went we haven't gone down into Orient Georgetown right. counties because we don't want to uh, we don't want to get in the way. Right. But um, we went into um, Marion County and um, out into to Latta and Bennettsville. Yeah the other day and it we met some some people in a neighborhood that was flooded out and they had been flooded before and it's it is the saddest thing we have to um, we have to do something we've got uh, situations with our farmers right now that they need federal aid and the federal government is very very slow in providing it and uh, we're going to have to um, we're trying to get the state to front that federal aid so that they don't go under because of the effects that um, that this flooding has had on on their livelihoods we've we met families uh, in shelters mm -hmm. that you know they were they went to the shelter the one in, in Blenheim right. they had 200 people in that shelter at one point and um, and then families when the floodwaters started to recede went home and saw that they had lost everything and a lot of them came back to the shelter so a lot of our people in the uh, northeastern part of the state are, are hurting pretty badly right now yeah and my brother actually goes to Coastal Carolina, so they'll be off for another week in Conway. Oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, and I know that you also said this, too, on your Twitter page. You mm -hmm. said this quote, When Florence has passed, we need to have a serious discussion about our neglected infrastructure in South Carolina. Seems yes. like, yeah, it says this also, too. Seems like we only take action for immediate danger when we also need to be planning for more serious long-term threats. What are those long-term threats, and how neglected is our infrastructure? Well, Quentin, you know when um, when Florence was threatening us. I mean, our storms are getting worse because our ocean water is getting warmer. The the warmer the ocean water gets, the the more severe our hurricanes will be. And I mean, we've seen that in recent years with Hurricane Katrina, right. Hurricane Matthew, right. Hurricane Sandy. Right. And um, and right now we have um, we have a lot of government leaders who deny that our waters are getting warmer, who deny that climate change is happening. And climate change is a real thing, and it is producing more and more severe storms. At the same time, we have tremendous development along our coast. And you see this in Charleston right. with the, uh, the flooding that happens that didn't happen 10, 20 years ago. So, you know, as, um, as Henry McMaster said in his, uh, in his last debate, something's melting and the water is rising, but he wouldn't say what it is. It's, it's very clearly climate change. And, um, and the water is not only rising, but it's getting warmer and producing more severe storms. We've got to be prepared for these things. When we were in Bennettsville, 
you know, it's not just flooding that we're seeing that, that is, it's not just water that's the cause of the problem. The, the flooding that we saw in a lot of these neighborhoods was uh, revealing problems in the septic system and, uh, and in the sewer system. I was a city attorney for 20 years. And, um, and I know a lot of our municipalities, when they built their sewer systems, they were the first entities you know, to build sewer systems in the state, they used clay pipe. And clay is just a part of the earth, and it returns to the earth eventually. Clay pipe will break down. Clay pipe is easily cracked and broken. And a lot of our sewer systems in South Carolina have tremendous cracks in them. When you have an issue like flooding, those cracks get revealed very in, in several places where we would see the flooding, we saw bubbles coming up and you could smell that you know, the sewer system had been breached or a septic tank had been breached. And, um, and that really shows up when flooding happens and unfortunately the flooding mixes with what's in there and, and creates serious environmental dangers. I have a friend who was reporting on a um, on flooding several years ago in South Carolina when Nichols was flooded, right. and um, and she jumped out of the boat and uh, that she was in and went into a house to get some some photos and and um, and the water you know it gets in you and you don't think about all the pathogens that are in that water. She became severely ill and um, and and you know to the point of of you know close to death because of all the pathogens that, that get released in, in this water when we have flooding like that. So it's not just about water rising, it's about everything it stirs up when it rises. So our, our neglected infrastructure in South Carolina is creating tremendous health hazards and will continue to as storms get more severe. And, uh, and it's something that we have to pay attention to. When things are in the ground like sewer pipes and water pipes and all that, we don't think about them if they're not causing a problem because we don't see them, but they must be addressed. We can't keep deferring maintenance on the things we don't see and letting it cause a tremendous problem down the road. We know our infrastructure on our roads has been neglected for a generation and we're having to address that now. And, uh, and our, we've got bridges that are, uh, that are unsafe at this point. And it's, it affects our economy too because we have um, businesses that have to divert their truck routes in order to get their goods to market because there are certain roads in South Carolina that they can't travel because the roads, roadways have been neglected and they're not safe for their trucks. So we have many, many aspects of our infrastructure that we have to address. And like I said, we generally will only um, address immediate threats in, uh, in government, and I think that is very short-sighted and very wrong of us. We need to be looking at five, ten years down the road. We need to look to what our children will inherit and what our grandchildren will inherit. And another discussion that people are talking about right now is offshore drilling. Oh my goodness, yes. Where are you with this discussion? I am going to fight offshore drilling with everything that's in me. Uh, you know, not just because South Carolina has a tremendous tourism economy. You know, we, we derive so much of our revenue in this state from the fact that we have such a beautiful, pristine um, stretch of beach along South Carolina's coast. I love it. It's where I go to recharge. And, and, and that is so important, I think, to every South Carolinian. And this is something that the vast majority of people in our state agree with us on. Uh, the fact that President Trump has suggested that, that he wants to place rigs off of our shores in South Carolina to, to drill for uh, oil is something that I think every South Carolinian needs to fight tooth and nail. Henry McMaster has touted his friendship with President Trump to say that's why people should vote for him. But yet, when he asks for an exemption to offshore drilling, Trump doesn't give it. So it doesn't sound like that's a, uh, a friendship that benefits South Carolinians. It might be a friendship that benefits Henry McMaster, but it's not benefiting the rest of us if he can't even get us an exemption to uh, offshore drilling. And, uh, but when James and I are in office, we are going to fight for our coast like, tooth and nail, and we will not stand for something like offshore drilling. So why should people vote for you and Jane Smith? Well, I just gave you one example of why, um, and the healthcare piece is another one, because there's so many differences between what we have now and what we'll have when, uh, when James and I are elected. You know, what we have now is a governor who refuses to accept federal healthcare funds. 
and um, and it, which would cover you know hundreds of thousands of our citizens with health care coverage. There's no reason not to accept those funds. It's like uh, refusing your own income tax refund. Nobody would refuse to accept their own income tax refund. This is money we've already paid to the federal government, and the federal government is saying, here, would you like to have $2 billion a year of your money back? And, and Henry McMaster is saying, no, thank you. We don't want that. And that makes no sense to me. Accepting that money is a no-brainer. Covering our citizens is clearly something we should be doing from a financial and moral perspective. And it would create 40,000 new jobs, an entire healthcare economy around taking care of our people. And that's something James will accept on day one and start making a difference in people's lives. That is huge. That's reason enough to vote for him. The um, other thing is public education. Yeah, I'm a product of Lancaster County Public Schools, right. and um, both of my parents had worked for the local textile mill before that. Okay. They were, um, my mama's people were sustenance farmers, and my daddy's people had been sharecroppers. And, um, and public education, to me, is the great equalizer. It is the promise that no matter who you are or where you come from, you can achieve anything if you're just willing to work hard. And, uh, and public education does that for, for our, our, our children and our families. But in South Carolina, public education has been neglected for a generation. And when I go to schools and I ask kids, you know, what do you want to be when you grow up? They're going to give me the same answer, no matter where they come from in life. Rich kids, poor kids, kids of all races are going to tell you they want to be a doctor, or they want to be a lawyer, or they want to be the president. Mm. But you know, it's our job to make sure that kids who come from relative poverty have have an equal opportunity to uh, to achieve their goals. And uh, and I think that we've neglected that obligation to our kids for a generation, and James and I will help restore that. So those are just three just quick examples of the differences between us and the current administration, and I think any one of them is reason enough to, um, to work hard to, to get us into office on this campaign. And obviously, you just mentioned that you've been to Marion and Georgetown yes. and other counties. Mm -hmm. I know recently you were in Aiken. Mm -hmm. What else people are telling you about the current administration in South Carolina? I think that, um, well, a lot of them are frustrated, you know, but the sad thing is I think a lot of people just feel like, they feel a little bit hopeless. And, and we're trying to run a, a hopeful, optimistic, and positive campaign to say, you know what, things can be a lot better. You know, your, your children can inherit a better South Carolina. Our best days are ahead of us if we if we get it together and and start all pushing in the same direction. Okay. And um, and that's you know, it's it's very disheartening when I see people who really don't don't fully understand how good it can be because we can have a we can have the South Carolina that doesn't exist yet, but but the South Carolina that we know is possible. And let me get back to infrastructure. I feel the access. Mm -hmm. But where are you and James when it comes to the extension of 526 potentially here in Charleston County? You know what? Somebody asked me that yesterday, and I think I know the answer to that, but I'm probably going to have to defer to James on okay. it because he's, uh, he sets the, uh, the policy for the campaign. Okay. And so uh, that's one that I, uh, I think I know, but okay. I'm not. I don't want to go out on a limb and, no and give our position on it. And let me get back to the state of South Carolina. Mm -hmm. The top three businesses in South Carolina, what are they in your mind? The top three businesses. Well, we have tourism. We, um, you know, one sad thing is um, manufacturing. That you know, manual labor manufacturing. That that's what my community was built on. We had the world's largest cotton mill in Lancaster, South Carolina, and it moved to Brazil in 2008. And uh, and I worked for the mill. I worked for the mill to pay for college. And when I got um, when I got through college and went to law school, I came home to practice law in Lancaster with my husband because I felt like my community needed me. And since the mill had left, I'm now filing bankruptcy for a lot of the people that I used to work alongside in the mill, and it's a really sad thing. That economy, we've made strides to try to replace manual labor manufacturing with more high-tech manufacturing. And those jobs 
are coming to South Carolina, but our challenge is training our workforce to fulfill those jobs. Okay. We have the opportunities coming in, uh, but it's uh, we have a disconnect between our education system and our um, and and the jobs that are available. And when kids are going to school, wouldn't it be great for them to have in their minds, okay, here's how the job that I may have in the future relates to what I'm learning now. And James and I are really committed to connecting the jobs that that are here today and will be here tomorrow with what kids will be learning in school and so that they can see that connection and have a, a very concrete goal in mind as they go through their education system. And that's a uh, that's that's huge for me. So, you know, manual labor manufacturing may not be the way of the future, but high tech manufacturing may be and we want to make sure that our kids are um, are prepared for those jobs. Describe to me the following one word. Tariffs. Tariffs. Job killing. That's a, that's a hyphenated word, but that's the uh, that's the word. The gas tax. The gas tax. It's um, a misnomer. And and if I oh, can okay. clarify oh, why okay. the gas tax is a misnomer, because you know the word tax really um, is is something that upsets a lot of people. The gas tax is um, something that, um, that James and I both supported. We call it the Rhodes Bill. Right. It was the bill that said, um, let's, let's get a bond and let's fix our roads and our bridges that have been neglected for the past 30 years. And we see a lot of roadway construction and bridge repair going on across the state now. It's not enough. It's, uh, it was a fraction of what we needed. But, um, but it added a few cents for every gallon of gas that you buy. Most people don't see it, and the vast majority of South Carolinians supported it. The vast majority of Republicans in the legislature supported it. And, um, and that was because, number one, it fixes our roads. You actually save money, I think, on uh, car repairs when you're riding on a, a smooth road. We had we heard from so many people who had to major realignment bills and they were, you know, having flat tires from hitting potholes and all that. But it also um, it is being paid in large measure by people who use our roads who are not South Carolinians. You know, people from North Carolina would come to South Carolina to buy their gas because it was so cheap. But we have people from all over the world vacationing in South Carolina and using our roads. And uh, they should have to pay for the upkeep of those roads. But at the time that we passed the roads bill, we had the fourth largest state-maintained roadway system, but one of the lowest gas taxes to maintain the roadways in the country. And, and that was not fair to our own citizens. The people from out of state were coming in using our roads, but our citizens were uh, having to foot the bill for the maintenance of those roads. And so now we, are, um, we have a, a much larger group of people who are from out of state who are, who are helping pay to maintain our roads. So I think it is a very fair system. It's, uh, it's resulted in some road construction that we desperately needed. And, um, and that's one thing that um, Henry McMaster has kind of attacked James for, for supporting the Rhodes Bill. But I'm proud to support the Rhodes Bill, and so is James, because we needed roadway repairs, and we need more. Scanna, Santee Cooper, and Dominion Energy in one word. <laughs> the word that came to mind, I can't say. Um, <laughs> I might have to pass, but I'll say use your imagination on that. <laughs> And one word is for Mandy Powell in the world. <laughs> um, embarrassed right now because oh. of the word I just thought of with Santee Cooper and Scanna. But um, um, I'm, I'm excited. I'm exuberant. I'm having a ball in this campaign. It's some of the most fun I've ever had in my life. And it's because I'm getting to meet people. And, and connect with people, and I've met some of the most fascinating people I've ever met, and that's just, I'm having the time of my life. That's so great to hear. <laughs> and one last question. Yes. What is your definition of lieutenant governor? What should be the role in your mind? It's very different now, because we are, um, you know, running together as a ticket for the first time in the history of our state, and the more I think about it, the more it, I, I just, 
find it so hard to believe that that we didn't do this before in South Carolina because running as a team, we're able to um, to you know help each other as we go, and we're able to craft legislative policy together and uh, and craft a plan together, and then when we're elected together, we'll be able to to work as a team to implement that plan. Before you know, the lieutenant governor and governor ran on separate tickets, their paths may never have crossed before they were thrown into this executive office to work together and um, and they were sort of kept separate for those reasons because they may not even know each other they may be from different parties or be political rivals and uh, I just don't think that's conducive to a good effective uh, team and so um, you know before the lieutenant governor would run the the workings of the Senate right. and uh, and would run the the Council on Aging even though they may have absolutely no expertise in the Council on Aging and so what we'll, we'll do this very differently. I will be um, going back and forth between the House and the Senate, not running their, their um, proceed, parliamentary procedure or anything like that, but working with legislators to, um, to craft the, um, the, the manifestations of a joint legislative agenda, to work out the kinks and the bills that, uh, that we want to see passed for things like health care and public education and infrastructure. And, and so I will, and I'll be able to do that because I have relationships yeah. with uh, House members and Senate members, right. and I think we're going to accomplish a lot together, and I'm, I'm really excited about this, this new way of, um, of running as a team as opposed to running separately. Representative Mandy Powell's Norrell and Democratic Lieutenant Governor nominee. Yes. Thank you so much for your time. Thank I really, really you. appreciate this. Thank you. I've enjoyed this so much. Likewise. Thank you again. Thanks. Thank you.